whatever your cup of tea is, you, we got to get back to basically getting married, people. It's as simple as that. Um, let's keep going, everybody. Uh, ladies, do you? we talked about this a little bit earlier. Do you think that the manosphere and the toxic aspects of the manosphere um, and toxic misogyny are the reasons why a lot of our men are leaving the churches in droves? And do you think that, uh, or do you think it's other reasons? Full disclosure, I left the church and I came back probably in my late 20s, early 30s. So I was one of those brothers that left. But ladies, do you think that the manosphere and misogyny is one reason why a lot of men are leaving the church? I'll let you go first with this one, Tati. I think that's one of the reasons, but definitely other factors as well. Some of the things that I've um, pointed out when it comes to um, some of the women and how they are so left and right and not in the middle, I think that that affects them. Good for it. Got you. Got you. Onika, how about you? Wait, way, way, way too deep. <laughs> yeah. Ladies, I mean, uh, Onika, do you think that uh, the manosphere in regards to I'm talking about the more the more uh, misogynistic, toxic uh, manosphere dudes? You think they're one reason why a lot of men just in general are just leaving the church in general. What are your thoughts on that? What do you think is other factors? Um, I think that's a part of it. Yeah. Um, there's also the politics of it. Um, and I think also just the the mere fact that the family structure in our community is almost non-existent. That's another part as to why they're not there. Um, typically, like nowadays, when I'm at church, the people that I typically see there, as far as males are concerned, they're usually older. They're like middle-aged and older, usually um, married. Uh, those are the gentlemen that I do see. I don't really see younger gentlemen there. So I think the breakdown of the family has a huge part to play with them not being there as well. Got you, got you, got you. Uh, fellas, we talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, the rise of feminism. Do you think that the concept that women should be strong and independent and not need a man is one reason why so many of our churches today are full of single mothers and to some extent, um, there are no women. I mean, sort of some extent, why a lot of women complain that there are no men in church. What the feminism? Do you think that's an aspect? Uh, Leo, I'll let you go first with this one. All right. So uh, we need to answer the question: Why does feminism exist? Feminism. If we want to be honest, I try to be balanced. Um, um, feminism exists as a response to basically overbearing patriarchy. Okay, that was the response. Um, so, but unfortunately, the pendulum have swung in the extreme direction. Okay, it was supposed feminism, I believe, initially was supposed to be a correction, but unfortunately, um, the voices that are taken over basically have are being more corrosive than um, helpful. So, I think that there's um, some you know, credence to, you know, why feminism is in the church, but there was no, there was no regulation uh, for it. And so men basically said, hey, listen, um, we knew that uh, we have a history of misogyny. We, we have a history of um, abuse and we repent of our way. We want to listen to women contribute. But then unfortunately what's happening is a lot of um, misandrists have taken over over right and so it's basically the message that's in the church is basically the church is filled with women the men are leaving and you know the pastor who, and not just pastors but you got steve harvey's you got the, the Derek jackson they're enabling and they're catering to this environment can i can i go next actually let me let jermaine go i i got you after that shot let me let jermaine go you good, you good, you good. for a little bit go ahead, you're up you're up um I think, I mean, okay, so look, I'll speak to my personal experience. Like I said, I haven't been there in a while. My personal experience, one of the reasons that definitely uh, was happening a lot right at the moment that I left that sort of fueled my distaste was, as my wife said earlier, was the politics. Um, I was in a situation, I was, you know, I was um, choir directing or whatever, you know, the church liked me. I was a young guy that was doing it. I was one of the the younger, the only really young people that was doing the choir director. I was one of them crazy ones. I was Kirk Franklin. I'm running all across the stage doing all this crazy stuff. People liked it. <laughs> now, we came from a very strict church. Um, we're Seventh-day Adventists, very strict. So what I was doing to them was something that they were not used to seeing in church. 
you know, and I, I was one of those people that was like, look, if I'm going to be in church, then I'm really going to be here for God, not for y'all. I'm not here for the drama. I'm not here for the extra. I'm not here for all these extra things. You know, I was super serious. I was, you know, Bible thumping, uh, Bible studies, like all of that stuff, like seriously, seriously hardcore into the church. And one of the things that turned me off is once I started doing the choir director thing, which was not my decision, by the way, I will let you all y'all know, I did not want to do this. This was a situation, like the minister of music literally forced me to do it because I was, I was playing drums in the background and I was good in the background. I wanted to stay there. And he was like, no, I feel like you could do this for some reason. So I did it. They liked it. Next thing you know, I've been doing it for maybe three, four months. I'm getting people talking to me. Did you hear that such and such director's jealous of you? Did you hear that such and such? And then they started making moves and doing all of this weird stuff. And my response to a lot of it was like, yo, what's all of this weird? I said, I ain't got no time for all of this. I, I'm, I'm not here for y'all. And a lot of people, oddly enough, when I said that, a lot of people were offended that I said, I'm not here for you. I'm not, I don't come to church specifically to go through politics and to go through all of this drama and all, it doesn't make sense for me to add this drama to the, to my life on the weekends. Um, one of the days that I don't got to go to work. Right. Like, why would I do that? So that was one of the things that I personally right. had to go through in my personal experience. I know that, you know, a lot of guys go through a lot of different things and there are a lot of things that are impressing upon them in the church. And some <laughs> things the pastors are saying in the pulpits and, you know, trying to acquiesce what is in the book so that it fits the narrative that is out there in the world. There's a whole lot of that. that There's a very specific way that the Bible speaks about how you are to carry yourself as a man, as a husband, and as a wife. And That's a lot right. of people want to change those things according yes. to what the world is saying. The the world, the Bible ain't never say nothing about you being independent, sis. Right. That's not but I, but I didn't pay you, That's I not even pay what you to we're say made that for. Like it's not even good for us to be by ourselves. So nope. that is counterproductive to what the book is saying. So when you start, and especially as a guy, if we look at the book and it say we belong together, and then you can look at them and say, we independent. And you're like, why is that in the church though? Right. I don't, that right. don't no, that's not what this say. If you ain't saying what this say, I don't gotta, what are we talking about? <laughs> you know? so, so for me, I all of that type of, all of those inconsistencies and stuff, um, I notice a lot of guys don't have, like you said, more structured. We're a lot less into dealing with that. We don't like, for instance, when they talk about the gossip and stuff, that's very anti-Bible, but also very active in the church. All of that stuff is for a lot of guys. You don't hear it as much as you hear it in churches from like a lot of the women, like the way that they carried and organized the churches were very counter to what a lot of, how a lot of guys are. We tend to be very simple, very straightforward. And if we got a problem, I'd rather go outside and punch you in your face than sit up here and talk about you for six months. Yeah. We can we can fight it out. And then at the end, when yeah. we all tired, because you know we ain't in shape like that. And we tired, you like, bro, I ain't even got no time to hit you no more. It's okay. You good, bro. We good. We sorry, dog. I ain't, I ain't even mean what I said, though. Well, like, I, I, would, I would rather, because that's how I was. When the situation happened, I tried to approach the person who was another guy about what was happening. And he was like dodging meetings and all of this weird stuff. And I was like, you know what? I'm good on it, bro. You could take the choir. I said, I didn't even want the thing. Go and take the choir. Everybody's like, no, we don't want you to go. I was like, peace. I, I'm sorry. I don't, I'm not going to add drama on the weekends and then go back to church. I mean, go back to work and then do more drama. That's not happening. So that was one of the things that I personally had to experience. And I think that there are a lot of guys when they get involved and they start to walk into those type of walls, those are the type of thing that can get a guy that's not just in church, but wants to be involved and make him pull back. Definitely. Definitely. I agree, Jay. I agree. Uh, I think Leo, you had your hand up or is it a will? Will. Well, what's your take on this, Will, as far as feminism inside uh, the church? What's well, I'll go, I'll, I'll go ahead. Um, I think, well, first of all, I think that men, black men were leaving the church way before the black manosphere came came along. Um, I, I noticed that when I was a teen, my early 20s, there wasn't a lot of guys there. Um, I think the, the black manosphere guys, they only report what's already happening. They're not encouraging something new. Um, I think it's it's sold as encouraging something new to women because women aren't necessarily focused on what men think about, right? Or or how we see things. So it seems like it's a new concept, but it's not a new concept. Um, I think that 
long term, I actually think it could be beneficial. And I think it can be beneficial in the sense of the first pastors or the, the first group of church leaders who recognize that, you know what, the men are actually important and they re strategize and refocus on trying to, you know, bring the pendulum back to the middle, sort of what Leo was talking about. That can bring some of the men back. Um, now, who's willing to take that leap of faith? I don't know. You know, um, there are obviously enough black men who are seeking um, spiritual guidance in one, one way or another. I don't think that is necessarily talked about because guys just don't express ourselves like that. But, you know, outside of church, I still do believe that there are a lot of black men who are still um, seeking that that spiritual guidance because one of the key aspects to being a marriage caliber, marriage, you know, minded man is you need to be able to have some spiritual authority that you're submitting yourself to so that you can be in a position to lead a household, right? So um, guys who are trying to prepare themselves for that, they're looking for a way to do that. Um, I do it whether I'm in the church or not, just because I just think that that's important enough for me to do. So the long and the short of it is I think that once pastors accept that, you know, the black manosphere narrative is real and you're not going to run from it, embrace it and figure out how to work with it, then do something about it. You know, Kevin, when he was still alive, I watched a broadcast that he specifically did about this subject. And, you know, one of the best things about Kevin was he didn't just preach about what the problem was. He offered solutions to it. So, you know, he had had after he had his his, his model along in the beginning and he brought in the guys and he had the guys call in and he had different pastors church leaders or whatever call in and they talked about you know certain aspects of things that they can implement to be able to try to get the men back into the church right so um once we can make that a focal point then i think that it's still an opportunity to do it because i still do believe that there's enough black men who want to be in church they just want to make sure that they're getting value at it and that the the bible as as it is and as its truth is being being given not sort of like an agenda based uh narrative in church great uh rashad you had your hand raised what's going on oh uh, you're next what's up so i wanted to speak directly to uh the feminism point because i think leo brought up a great point in terms of it being a response but a response in what i mean to to what group though you see what I'm saying? Because this whole misogyny piece, this, you remember we talked about history earlier. The women's suffrage movement was a response to, um, to the men in the white community. The white community brothers were, you know, at that time, you know, titans of industry and getting into jobs and all that sort of stuff. And then their women were helping them get to these places at that time, right? But when it came time to you know bring you know you know bring someone up bring someone up uh, the women the white women thought that it was their turn but they started giving those benefits to black men that's what that's what sprawled the women's suffrage movement you see what i'm saying and so as it was at that point right there that white white women at that time were like wait a minute we helped you get to this place and you're going to give this to you know, give all our hard work away to men that don't look like us. And so they started marching in the streets and they brought our sisters along. And see, at that time, again, you got to couple that with poverty. You got to couple that with war at the time. Again, three th th three different things. And you have to couple that with the government as well, with, uh, with welfare and all of that sort of stuff. Removing, it's always been a removal of us from the household itself. So again, we never talk about this from a historical standpoint. And I just want to make sure that that's heard on this podcast today, that sometimes it's not always our men's choice to not be in the household. Uh, because again, we were uh, what was happening in the 40s and 50s when we were, when we were married at 70, 80%, people pulling up, putting crosses on the yard, all right? And uh, people being burned at the stake, and we were still married at 60, 70 percent. Right. See what right. I'm saying? Right. So there was that we gotta start understanding what the hidden hand is. Again, if we don't get that on this podcast today, get this. That hidden hand agenda of why they don't, you know, and when I say they, the dominant order of things does not want black people to come together for whatever reason. 
right? And you and I both know or should know that the reason is, like you said earlier, Chris, that the cheat code is being married because two incomes is better than one, right? Mm -hmm. You can buy more things with two incomes than you can with one. Am I correct? Absolutely that if right. you buy a house together, what's the odds that you can buy another house and another house? And then y'all might buy y'all might be playing Monopoly and go and buy you a two door, a three door, a four door. Y'all work your way up to 25 units or 100 units or whatever. And now all of a sudden we're looking at, you know, black multimillionaires. We don't want that. Right. So what we got to do is create, you know, continue to feed on social media this narrative of feminism and you don't need the black man. Gotcha. See what I'm saying? Just to pick, your point. Yeah, just you to piggyback, off. Leo, let me let me go ahead real quick. Just to piggyback off of you, Rashad, if you have two incomes, I can, um, in one of, your, uh, one of the people is an upper income earner, you can live off the higher income salary and then invest 90 to 100% of the other person's income into real estate, into property, into land, into uh, index fund, into a mutual fund, into an IRA, into um, a SEP IRA. Literally, there are so many different cheat codes when it comes to having more money. And that's one reason why there is a legit agenda to keep the black female and the black man at war with each other. It started with slavery. Then it went to Jim Crow. Then it went to red line districts. Then it went to the war on drugs. Then it went to mass incarceration. Then it went to voter suppression. Today, they're pushing feminism. These are weird. These other strange agendas or whatever they're trying to push. And it's keeping us in chains. If you take a look at the Indian community, and I'm going to do a podcast on this. They have a divorce rate right now of 1.3%. The divorce rate wow. in the black community is um the last time I checked was almost 40%. That's the right. wealthiest community in America right now is the Indian American community. Yeah. The poorest demographic in America right now is the black community. Do you think that the divorce rates have nothing to do with that? Yeah. When it comes to out of wedlock like yeah. when it comes to out of wedlock -like marriages, I mean out of wedlock -like marriage, out of wedlock -like, uh, childbirth, I'm sorry. The Indian community is less than 5%. In the black community, I've seen studies say it's as high as 70%. Right. So do you really think that it's a coincidence that the richest group of people in America right now, which is the Indian American community, then it's the Asian community, then it's the Nigerian community, then it's the white community, and then it's other communities, and, the final, and fortunately in the end, it's the black community. Do you really think it's a coincidence that the most married people, as well as the people with the least amount of children out of wedlock, are also the wealthiest? Mm -hmm. It's not people. And there's a reason why you have shows like Scandal and Real Wives of Hip Hop that continue to push this trash in our communities or whatever about you don't need a man, you don't need to get married. This is all by design, people. Yeah, right. It's completely all by design. Chris, that Asian community, too. I want y'all to just say this. You know, think about this question. I'm getting ready to ask y'all. Have y'all ever seen a homeless Asian person? <laughs> I have Ooh. in Korea and Singapore. I have, have you ever seen in Singapore. It? <laughs> no, in America. In America. Right. In America. Ooh. Think Not about a lot. it. I have, I, I have a shot, but I've traveled a lot, bro. Like I'm talking about like LA and places like that, though. So I, I have, but I've been right. a block. So yeah, but you, you right. don't see it though. You don't see it. <laughs> yeah. I, I just also want to say, because uh, a lot of what I want to say, Chris just touched on it, but I also want to um, mention that you notice that um, that uh, TD Jakes and uh, what's that guy that played Madea? You notice that Tyler Perry. Tyler Perry. Tyler Perry. They're they're singing a different song now. Yeah. You notice they're singing a different song. Yeah. They were the one that also was pushing a certain agenda as well to in the churches in uh, and the programming on our on on in the movies in the cinemas on media. But now they're singing a different song. Why? That's a good. Yeah. That's a good question, man. I think you know. I, but it, media is powerful, and I think that we need to understand that because the crazy part is, y'all, we have over one point seven trillion dollars. You know, spending of spending power is that right, Chris? That's correct. Right, we That's spend correct. it on products that we are used to market. We don't yeah. understand our profit share in that. You see what I'm yeah. saying? And so again, if we directed our spending and understood what was being done to us, then that would be the case. But I will say this: as an educator and a lifelong educator, I'll say this: that K through 12 environment. That kindergarten through 12th grade is really where we learn a lot of times how to be intellectually lazy, right? Mm. Not study, not comprehend, not understand what's really going on. Because also the information, can you, under, you know, would you guys understand like it, what would happen to us if we really understood politics and the agenda of politics in our local community? If we really honestly studied economics, 
if we really honestly learn trades as well as education while we were in school and learn the value of dollars before we graduated high school, like into what high school used to be back in the day with your home ex of the world, your auto parts and all that sort of stuff, right? right? If they instituted that back into the community, because I think that also too, the difference between white collar and blue collar millionaires is nothing. I'm going to tell you that now. This Blue collar weird. people, people that own like laundromats and stuff like that, they can eat anywhere the white the, the white collar person eats. But that's not what's being sold to us. Right? right. I, I met a brother, and I'll say this and I'll shut up. I met a brother that fixed elevators from North Carolina to Florida. Oh, he's, he's making money. He's getting job. Three or four hundred K easy. Half a million easy. He said, I started making, he said, after I trained for two years, he said, I started immediately making $180,000 a year. And I've been making that and more for for almost he's like twelve years in the game at this point. Five hundred k easy. I can believe that. I'm somewhat halfway in the blue collar world. That's how I pay for college, so I know that world extremely well. I'm telling you right now, all the electricians, all the master plumbers, all the master carpenters, all the master electricians. If you're willing to travel, as in you work in Chicago in the summertime, you want to work in Miami in the winter, that's half a million dollars a year right there. Yes, sir. If you're an electrician, if you're an ele a licensed Easy. electrician or or uh, uh, or elevator operator, what's Easy. crazy is when black people did that kind of work in the '70s, they weren't paying us that. But as soon as we took right. those kind of communities and those kind of home ec classes, those kind of trade schools out of our inner city high schools, that's when they started making all that money. Mm, so we yeah. got to get back into the trades. We got to get back into science, technology, engineering, math, healthcare. Rashad, you hit the nail on the head with that, bro. You hit the nail on the head with that. Let's keep it moving. Sure. So I want to respect for you all's time. So to all the ladies on this panel, all of you all are highly educated. You own your own businesses. You're working professionals. The Bible describes the Proverbs 31 woman as trustworthy, as hardworking, um, as business savvy, as entrepreneurial. It says that she had strong arms, so she obviously must have worked out. Um, and also says that she uh, basically cooked dinner for her, cooked breakfast, lunch, and dinner for her family. Uh, ladies, as mothers, as business owners, as entrepreneurs, and as professionals, do you think the Proverbs woman is realistic? Um some parts of it <laughs> some parts of it it depends on um what woman what kind of woman we're talking about if she's you know a feminist because cooking for your for your husband and all of that you know some i would say some of that has disappeared or some of the um some of the thoughts behind that you know it's a bit different um but yeah, some to some degree. <laughs> why, would, why, why would cooking for your husband be something that a, a feminist or any woman would not want to do, though? As a married man, that makes no sense to me. Why, why would you not want to cook for your man? It, uh -oh. it's, it's not necessarily in cooking for your man. <laughs> it's, it's the idea of being oh independent and, you know, um, whatnot. I'm not saying that that's me, <laughs> but um, I yeah, it just depends on the kind of woman. All my men that are listening, uh, if your lady works 12 hours a day, if you if she comes home and you have cooked her favorite meal, that's the best foreplay imaginable. <laughs> so cook for your lady. I, I, this nonsense that you don't want to cook for your partner is, is BS, seriously. Yeah. So any feminist, a toxic man of moron saying that kind of stuff, ignore them completely. Let them basically go home to a vibrator because they're not I'm serious. Right. Cook, for your, cook for your partner. It's as simple as that, all right? Hey, um, I, I co-sign this message. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, I don't get it. Cook your lady, brothers. dude. It's as simple as that. It's the best uh, foreplay imaginable. You hit that hot water cornbread on them, bro. They're going to help. I'm telling you. <laughs> that hot time. water cornbread. And your grandmama's <laughs> cooking. I'm telling you, it works every time. Tell you, every time. <laughs> And if your wife is West Indian like mine, find out how to cook her favorite meal and don't tell her you know how to cook it. I promise you, it's going to be a great thing. <laughs> so, let's keep it moving. Uh, Anika, you as well, the Proverbs 31 woman. Do you think that uh, that the Bible describes her as trustworthy, honest, hardworking, business savvy, entrepreneur, responsible? She cooked. She was not, uh, she, she took care of her body because it says she has strong arms. She was not obese. Do you think that lady is um, realistic? I think so. I think it could be. It just depends on, on, um, Again, it depends on, uh, I think age. I think age has something to do with it. Um, I also think culturally um, that has something to do with it as well, just depending upon how you were raised. Um, because I don't, I don't think that you being basically a wife, a mother, an entrepreneur is something that's unrealistic. I feel as though a lot of women do that nowadays. So I don't think that that's unrealistic. Um, but it just, it, I think it depends on your culture, the age demographic that you're looking at, and then your environment. Got you, got you. 
Uh, fellas, uh, do you think the Proverbs, are you seeing the Proverbs 31 woman in your dating experience? Rashad, you go first because your hand is up. So I'll, also say, say, I'll say this about the Proverbs 31 woman. Her husband, he uh, had so much uh, respect for what she was doing. He didn't even, he basically literally spent most of his time with the political leaders and the um, prime ministers of his country because his wife was holding down so well at home. And to me, there's a metaphor to that. If you marry the right woman, she's a force multiplier in your life and she's gonna have everything so taken care of. You can focus on what's happening, starting a million dollar business. You can focus on basically dominating corporate America and starting your own business. But that's another, that's, that's, a, that's a conversation for another day. Rashad, you had your hand up first, so you go first. Do you think the Proverbs 31 woman, A, is realistic, and B, are you finding her out in these dating streets, in the, in the churches, in the happy hours, in the singles ministries, they are, in, in the clubs? Do you find this kind of woman? Give me the definition for a Proverbs 31 woman. Say it slow. So the Bible Say says, for the people. Yeah, she was trustworthy. She was hardworking. She was business savvy. She was entrepreneurial. Uh, she held it down at home. She had kids for them. She cooked breakfast. She cooked lunch. She cooked dinner. Uh, her children were all, uh, uh, her children were all uh, dressed and they were all well behaved. They were all clothed. Uh, it says that she took care of her arms so that she was not obese. She basically worked out. And her tr husband trusted her so much that he left all of his affairs to the house in her so he could basically handle things outside the home. Um, in your experience of dating the modern day woman, are you seeing the, the, the Proverbs 31 woman um, inside or outside the church? Uh, both. So I will say this. I think that to um, Anika's point, they, I mean, women are already doing that, right? They're already doing that. Uh, and we're doing that, you know, as, as men. But see, again, I have to say this. The problem is the ego. And the second problem is who we're doing it for. Because the thing is, if we make all this money, who are we sharing it with? If we are titans of industry, what are we doing with that money? So we just talked about the point of real estate and all of that. If you only got one door, right, and you're paying, you know, paying mortgage to a company, but you don't have money working in any situation where you don't have money working for you. Right. Are you in the best financial position that you can be in? No, you can be in a better financial position. So I would say that the, the Proverbs 31 woman is there. But the, the question is, the ego piece, who is she doing it with and for, right? And then also, does she understand the importance of conjoining that work, that workmanship with the husband? And does the husband understand his role as well? Because again, in my studies, you know, when I left the church and all that sort of stuff, I started studying African spirituality in a sense. And what they were saying in, in those times, were well, not that the woman was here and the man was here, both of them were here we got to get back right here okay mm -hmm. and that cannot happen without having ego there see and then again with the bible piece we have to understand that the that the bible should in my opinion be taught as an instruction manual on how to live all right good points good points uh leo i'll let you yeah. go next bro uh how about you the proverbs 31 woman are you seeing her at the ymca are you seeing her at the gym are you seeing her at church are you seeing the uh, singles ministry are you seeing her in the networking events are you seeing the Proverbs 31 woman as described in the Bible in your dating experiences? I'm seeing her overseas, to be honest with you. Yeah. Hey, Leo, speak up a little bit, okay? Your mic. Yeah, I said, um, I'm seeing her overseas. Um, you know, I mean, I'm on social media. Um, uh, a lot of my friends, uh, they have uh, pretty much imported their wives uh, from Africa to the Philippines, uh, from, mm -hmm. um, including the Caribbean. Uh, you married uh, a Proverbs 31 woman. She was here. All right. So, uh, yes, they are here. Um, but I believe that uh, um, due to the narrative that's out there where black men ain't ish, where they believe that they out earn us and things like that. I don't think that they value us. But I find other cultures around the world that are not of Western, don't have the Western narrative. They tend to have a more um, understanding of family and and um and a, a more uh grounded principle uh mindset got you got you all right how about yourself will what are your thoughts on this the proverbs 31 woman are you seeing her in your dating experiences in uh, mia um i'll say this personally um i think i think it's it's everything's possible um you know i think it's also realistic as well i you know my best friend she's a black woman we've been best friends for over 25 years um she's married now she has a kid because i've actually literally grown up with her i've seen all of these aspects within her right so um she's probably the closest thing that i know to that um 
in my particular life to the Proverbs 31 woman. Um, to Leo's point, I in abundance, it's more so overseas. Obviously, you know, the cultures are different. They're they're bred to be that certain type of way. Right. Um, you know, feminism drives ego in women. Right. So ego is sort of the antith antithesis of what a Proverbs 31 woman is. So um, it because of that, because that is sort of the prevailing culture that's in the younger women, then it makes it less realistic. But I won't say it's 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 impossible. I think that that Proverbs 31 women exist. Um, they're they're often, you know, ashamed to come out and be that um, to stand bold on that just because of the culture of women will, you know, sort of try to suppress them shame them bash them things of that nature i think that we as men can help you know give those women confidence by lifting them up publicly right we need to do our part in lifting up those type of women publicly because the average young girl today is going to turn on her instagram and see some girl shaking her behind and getting a bunch of likes and simps in a comment section and that's what's gonna that's gonna drive her 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 rationale right but you know seeing more of the trad con let's call it traditional conservative woman being uplifted by men from various parts of the world i would love to be able to see that, that sort of propelled on social media a lot more got you got you got you uh will leo is shot you got and my wife is a immigrant she was born and raised in a third world country um so I kind of definitely see where you guys are coming from with this. But for my listeners, all of you guys have mentioned before about women raised overseas or in different countries and non-Westernized women. Why is that you think? What are your dating experiences been like dating non quote unquote American women? And what makes them quote unquote different from uh, uh, American women? I dated the entire rainbow full disclosure. So I could talk about this, but I want you guys to bring it up instead. What makes quote unquote dating non-Western women better, if you will? Will you raise it first? Um, so I'll, I'll go first. So I'll give two different examples, but, um, so my other, so I have two best friends. One's a guy, one's a girl. The one who's a guy, he's been married for 12, 13 years. So I remember when I met his wife, the very first night that I met her, um, we went down to our house, uh, we're in Harlem and we go down to her apartment and her and her friend are there and me and my boy are coming through. So within the first two minutes, you guys want something to eat or you hungry, you want something to drink, sit us down on the couch. You know, we tell her, yeah, we want to drink a beer, hamburger, whatever we, we asked for. Immediately she went into the kitchen. I mean, it wasn't any more than hi, nice to meet you. She asked a question, you guys sit down, take off your shoes, get comfortable, this and that. They went right into the kitchen. I sit down and I look at my boy like, what's going on type of thing, right? And and he's just smiling and laughing. So, you know, we're just having small talk throughout the day or throughout the night, whatever. And after she gets done coming into the, into the living room, she sits down, she serves us, obviously. And then she's asking me questions to get to know me. So I was sort of thrown back initially. Now, she's a Dominican woman. Um, and I was initially thrown back by that. But... Just going through that first night, that experience of how welcoming she was just by default, that was her default mindset. I was like, wow, I have not run into that. Like, I, I get why he's interested in her. Right. So mm -hmm. um, there's that perspective. Then there's the, the aspect of, you know, I've been overseas, you know, multiple times in my life. Um, Europe a couple of times, the Caribbean, such and so forth. So. I see, I, I pay attention to interaction of actual couples that are, that are there. Um, and I see how women just interact with their men, how, how, how focused they are on inspiring him. I guess you could say if, 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 if there's one thing I, I would always say is that they have a certain level of inspiration for their men, um, that they, it just oozes out in their energy. Right. And, you know, a lot of the guys, sometimes they take advantage of that, which is something that men need to correct. But I think that their default mindset of the typical woman that's overseas is to inspire, to 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 nurture um, their man. 
and you know because they're not necessarily um, bombarded with program programming to do the opposite of that they're they're much more comfortable in being in that space um you know our women here they have been sort of force fed this this concept of you know don't do anything for men um make them do all the work for you um that sort of thing and i think that 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 programming women and especially young women are very um you know what's the word? they're you know they're you no know, they can be um not manipulated but you know they're impressionable right so mm -hmm. um that's really sort of the the two big differences that that I, I i've seen is you know just the cultural default mindset is overseas is to inspire and to nurture your man up front because they get joy and pleasure out of that and i think the the women here they're not necessarily shown that there's joy and pleasure that you can get out of it onika and uh, tatiana what are your take on that what do you what do you think about to what will just said Um, I, I would tend to agree, um, to be honest, I've noticed, um, well, maybe it's just because of my background, my upbringing, um, my family is from, um, from Guyana. So from the Caribbean and I notice a difference between, um, my relatives and my friends who are like West Indians versus, um, versus like my American friends. And I can see it also from friend, um, people that I know from overseas as well, like friends um, who are from the Philippines and different things of that nature. There is a difference in how they tend to approach um, the men for the most part overall in their lives. They tend to be very, um, they cater to them. They wanna make sure that they're taken care of. Um, definitely, um, Will, you were talking about the experience you had when you came to the house and you know, yeah. hi. Can I get you something to eat? Can I get you something to drink? That's very much a part of like the Caribbean culture as well from, you know, from my upbringing and different things of that nature. Those are some of the things that we do. And it's just kind of a, a natural thing to just make sure, um, not just for your man, but just also in general, just to be hospitable um, for those who are coming into your home to take care of them and make sure that they feel good and different things of that nature. So I, I, I do agree with that. And I tend to definitely see that more, not necessarily, um, in people who are from the Western part of the world versus, or in America, I should say, versus like people from the islands and people from other countries and things of that nature when it comes to women and how they kind of take care of their, their man. Got you, got you. Uh, Tatiana, how about you? What do you think about what Will uh, and what Onika have said about this? I would um, agree completely. Just um, growing up, I'm Haitian family Haitian, um, and same thing, Caribbean, um, very, very, very different. Their outlook on family, their men, completely different than American <laughs> women. So I, I agree. Got you, got you. From a dating perspective uh, and everything, um, there's two ladies on here as well as to the men that goes out there as well. Would you advise younger women who do want to be married to, to kind of start emulating what European and what Asian and what West Indian women are doing because they are the ones getting married. Let's just cut right to the chase. So would you advise these women to, yes, you need to learn how to cook for your man. You need to, uh, I don't know if you guys have ever been to Latin America, but I never, I very rarely see morbidly obese women in Latin America or in Europe. I just don't. Even the parts of Africa that I've been in where the women over there are very shapey, very curvy, you don't really see a lot of morbidly obese women. So would you ladies say that uh, in order for women to quote unquote get, uh, um, to get uh, a husband, they do need to start kind of doing what Africans, what West Indians, what Asians, what European women are doing? Yeah, I would, absolutely. I would, say, I would say yes, but I would also say on top of that, um, to start looking at themselves internally <laughs> because the thing that you do for yourself or even how you see yourself as a woman will literally portray how you treat everything how you treat family how you treat a man how you treat everywhere and it starts with yourself so that's the one thing that i would absolutely and you know focus on is how you see yourself as a woman absolutely absolutely yeah. Two more questions I want to go in just so I can respect everybody's time. 
Uh, fellas, let's say you were at a church that had 300 single women and had 75 single men and a pastor or the youth pastor or some uh, elder said, okay, Leo, Rashad, Will, I'm going to put you guys, I want you guys to start helping me plan some um, singles ministry events or whatever so that these couples, these people can start getting married. Uh, Rashad, I'll let you go first with this one. What events would you plan so that the 300 single women could be in a room with the 75 single men, they can start talking? I'll let you go first with this one. Actually, Jermaine, you go first with this one. I'll let you go oh, first Lord. with this one. <laughs> <laughs> what oh. events did you plan? Because these uh, the events that I've been to were absolute trash. They were whack. So what, what events? Man. Did you <laughs> um, man, I'm an old school fool, man. I don't even know. I, <laughs> and, and our, I guess, when we were doing things, uh, the events that we had. I mean, I was a young guy. They was doing like basketball games and stuff like that, and it would just be sort of a natural progression of people grouping off and 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 sort of just sort of attracting uh the type of people that they want around them and then it's like everybody within that nexus of people that formed a group would just start interdating each other so so the experience that i had because we met and we got married through church so but our thing was for our particular situation it was literally our parents mm -hmm. they they ran into each other our mothers hit it off lovely and then they brought the families in and then me and my brother were hanging with her and her siblings and then the, the group of sort of expanded and then there started to be like interdating within the group or whatever so i haven't the slightest clue to be honest <laughs> what i would plan i mean because for us it was just you know i'm early 20s 19 between I would say between 19 and say 25 is what these things these things were happening and i i didn't do no singles ministry i'm just be 100 i've seen what some people do with singles ministry uh, we watched a podcast not too long by uh the dear future wifey podcast and they did this singles ministry thing they had a panel there with like marvin sap and um uh kenny Lattimore and all of these people on there and they were talking and stuff and the people in the audience did like a little q a and they were talking about the types of things that they're settling i mean doing and they're like yeah we have this single ministry and i was told to come out to single ministry and they're planning these things and there's nothing but women there when they do the single ministry thing and i think i guess the first thing you got to do is you just got to get the men in the church in the first place so in a situation like yours which is very specific I haven't, I mean, don't lean towards stuff that guys don't want to go to, I guess would be the first thing I would say. I mean, do something where everybody would sort of enjoy it. For me, that that was our thing. We used to be doing the basketball games for the most part. Um, and then whatever types of clubs and stuff they had in there that were there. But I, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm the wrong person to uh, be answering that question. I will. Your hand is up. Uh, you next, bro. Um, I think the, the, the fundamental reason why single mixers don't work um, is because they don't prioritize the people who control the access to the race relationships. So men control access to relationships. You need to prioritize the men. Those single mixers, they pitch it to the women, but the women still have to be selected by men in order for them to get into a relationship. So you're working backwards. What I would do is totally different from anything. I would actually sort of, use the concept that Kevin Samuels used when he used his, the mixed group. If I had a church that had 75 guys, 300 women, whatever, the men, first of all, would have to go through a pre-qualifier. I have to se separ separate the guys who actually marriage caliber from the guys who were just playing around. The guys who were just playing around, you don't even get to move to the next step. Pookie and Ray Ray, they, would, they wouldn't even be allowed to <laughs> come to the event. And not even, not even just the Pookie and Ray Rays, but the players named Day Day. Like, mm -hmm. those guys you know there's a lot of players in the church too they got to move to the side so you take the, the the guys that are actually serious about being marriage and you work with them then the women there's a pre-qualifier that they have to meet too to be able to 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 qualify to even be able to be in the room with these guys kevin samuels the mixed group he took like-minded men and like-minded women and he vetted them himself and then he put them in a group together he didn't just throw a bunch of random people in so I would take that model, whereas I would pre-qualify the men, get the best of the best men, and then get the pre-qualified women, get the best of the best women, and work with them. Got you. Leo, I know you had some experience of working with a um, singles ministry before. So if you were in this situation, 300 single women, 75 single dudes, and a, a pastor said, okay, Leo, I want you to start planning some events. What events would you plan and why? Uh, honestly, I can't better what Will said. 
Um, that's actually. Uh, hey, Leo, you're venue. breaking up. The only thing that's needed is a venue. So whether, um, as I, I cannot better what Will said. So uh, the only thing that's missing is the from his model or Kevin Samuel's model is the the venue, and that would be a ski resort. You know, uh, something mm -hmm. where it's intimate, something where it's also physical for the men. You know, not just something where you go for a spa. No, you have to have some yeah. interaction. We like to move, right. uh, you know, or even camping, you know, that it doesn't necessarily have to be in the in the woods. It can be at a nice little retreat, you know, hotel, you know, but an opportunity for women to come out and be in the beach, you know, see what they're looking like and so on and so forth. But that's, that's all I have to add to that, you know, but essentially, uh, why it, singles ministry has failed in the, in the past, as you as you know, you said, Chris, I was part of singles ministry, is because the caliber of women that we're looking for are not basically there. You know, we you know, what I mean, it's 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 the it's the it's the truth. You know, that the, the, what the men are looking for, uh, but women are going to always be there, but you know, it, it flops every time because the women that we want to be there are not there. Right. So I'll say this, Chris. So, um, so Obsidian, Obsidian is, is one of the founding fathers of the Black Manosphere, right? So they just had a conclave a couple of weeks ago in Atlanta. The way that they set up their weekend retreat was they focused in on getting the men right, and then the women were allowed to come later on to interact with the men. The men took care of their business throughout that entire weekend, throughout the day learning different skill sets um, to be to essentially, you know, raise their value as men all the way around. Right. After that, they would have certain mixers where women were allowed to interact with these men. But the women had to meet whatever their, their pre-qualification standards were in order to even be in the room with these guys. That's the difference between a mixture that would actually work versus the general concept, because they're bringing the best of the best men to deal with to begin with and then say, asking those guys, OK, what are the type of women that you want? And then we'll bring those women into the room. These other models is just throw out an idea to a whole bunch of women and whatever men that show up are just the men that show up. Well, the average guy who knows how those models go, if I'm worth something, I'm not going to those kind of mixers. For all the reasons that that every like you said, Chris, like, you know, it's women that's, you know, non-select, to be honest, the non-select women that's going to, to those to those mixers and guys, smart, competent, marriage minded men already know that that's the majority that's there. I'm not bothered with that. So you got to focus on what the qualified men want and bring them qualified women. Got you. Let me open this up to the ladies. Um. Let's say you were at a church, uh, 300 women, 75 single men, 300 single women, 75 single women. And the pastor's wife said, okay, Tatiana, okay, Onika, I want you guys to plan an event because I see these people at church and they're never talking. I want you guys to get them talking and mingling. What events would you ladies plan? I agree with um, what I believe it was, was it Will? Yeah, Will <laughs> said, um, when it comes to putting together an event that caters to both absolutely that caters to both so keeping the men and what they absolutely like or draws them in mind and then also the women as well so so if it was something physical like uh we're gonna walk uh we're gonna uh, mountain climb for two days and then after that we're gonna have a, uh, a mixer something physical that all that the men will be in agreement with you think that's something that would kind of draw the ladies it should it should not not sure. it should <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think sure. that, it, that men are just are the only ones that's physical. You know what I mean? It's yes, they are, but women can be as well. So it should. It shouldn't be a problem. I think I speak for most of the brothers that are on this panel right now. One thing that we like about physical stuff, Leo, you said it because it weeds out certain um, non-select women that we don't want to be there. <laughs> I'll, I'll just leave it at that, okay? <laughs> Straight up. If hey. a woman's not willing to walk, let's just say a couple miles up hey. a uh, <laughs> steep mountain. Yeah. That's I was about to say, yeah. that hike, that hike can get yeah. anybody. <laughs> All right, Anika, uh, Anika as well. If you were planning an event, um, like I said, 300 women, 75 men, 4 to 1 ratio, how would you, what events would you, what kind of events would you plan? 
Um, I mean, I think what everybody shared thus far, I mean, that makes sense that you would want to do something that's going to, um, that would be appealing to both. But I think um, bringing up Kevin Samuels and, you know, his model, it makes sense because we know that men hold the key to relationship and women hold the key to sex. So it's like, if you, if women want relationship and it would make sense that whatever events that we're planning, um, because men hold the key to relationship, that it should be more male centered as far as things that we know will get them there. Um, Cause I feel like most women, if they want, if there's a mixer, if there's an opportunity for them to, to find men that are marriage material, for the most part, I don't think they would have a problem going to just about anything. Um, because if that's what they want, they're going to go, you know, to it. Um, so planning something like, you know, mountain hiking or, you know, something physical, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, and I think, like I said, most women who are looking for a relationship, they wouldn't have a problem doing that. And the ones that would have a problem doing that, those would be the ones that you guys wouldn't want anyway. So there it is. <laughs> yeah, well said. Leo, you had your hand up, I think, bro. Um, go ahead, then I'm gonna ask the final question. Go ahead. Well, I actually was giving Onika a hand when, when basically, uh, was Leo, you, you, Leo, your mic, your mic. Okay, I'm sorry. I was basically um, affirming what uh, Anika was, was saying. But uh, one more thing as well is that um, being, um, I have attended a, a few single ministry and what I've noticed like, uh, you will have uh, attractive women there. And basically what happens is they get paid, paid it on by the majority because they automatically knew that a lot of the men that are present would basically gravitate about um, ar ar around that. Cause I'm, and even if two women are the most attractive women in the room, they are also competitive against each other, you know? Because I've, I've been to singles ministry where I saw two women, um, gorgeous women, and and um, I was trying to decide which one I should talk to first. I was going to talk to both of them. It's a singles ministry, right? So I said, you know what? This one is on my right. So I'm going to talk to her first. Spoke to her. Everything went well. And then eventually I didn't make it obvious and go talk to the other attractive. I, I, I kind of worked the room. Eventually I got to her. And, you know, she was like, oh, you, you were having a lot of fun over there with that girl. And, you know what I'm saying? Brought up a lot of drama. And so this is some of the things why men don't attend singles ministry because it's a meat market. And, and some of these women, even the older women, are very immature and they can be desperate. So it can become a very toxic oh. environment. Got you. Got you. Got you. My last question is this. Um, there are a lot of YouTube channels, obviously, out everybody that essentially teach you, quote unquote, how to become a high value man, how to smash as many women as possible, how to basically bone as many and uh, keep them moving. And ladies, there are a lot of YouTube channels out here teaching you how to create OnlyFans accounts, basically teaching you how to manipulate men, use them for sex, and you can basically get all their money and then eventually die miserable and alone. Um, but there are very, very few YouTube channels out here that are teaching you how to make your marriages and your relationships work. So to Onika and um, Jermaine, you guys have been married uh, a lot longer than I have been married. What are some pieces of advice you would give um, to the men and to the women that are on this podcast as well as to my listeners? Because um, I do think that there is a very large percentage of black, white, and Asian and Hispanic people out here who do want to honestly have successful relationships, successful marriages. And you guys, I think, have said you've been in the game nearly 25 years, which is amazing. So what advice would you give to us? Because all of us, my, I'm married, but to everyone on this panel, I do believe we at one point do want to get married and have a family. What advice would you give us about how to make your relationships and ultimately if you want to get married, how to make your marriages stand the test of time? Will, check the chat real quick, Will. Okay. Um, I guess I'll say, okay. I'll say one of the, one of the things that um, my wife and I have no, noticed recently is that for a lot of the things that we talk about, we talk about a lot of the transactional pieces of relationships. And especially if you're talking about the church, when you're talking about the church, I do personally believe, and I know every guy is not in that space because of it leaves you vulnerable, but I think the type of relationship that you're able to cultivate with this person is one of the things that a lot of people overlook to get them through the rough times. Um, we put it out in our channel, I know a lot of you, you know, you might not know it, but my wife had a scare with uh, lymphoma. It was devastating. This was just last year. It crushed us. And 
the doctors were talking about her having to go and have, you know, do chemotherapy and all of the things that happened. It was devastating. It wasn't something that we expected. We were, you know, she's exercising. She's adjusting her diet. She's doing all of the things that people would say are the right things. She's trying to stay away from processed foods. She's trying to increase her fruit and vegetable intake. She's doing all of these things that are right, making sure she drinks a certain amount of water. She's doing all of these things. Then that comes out of nowhere and knocks us off of our feet. The things that got us through all of that, all of that, in addition to dealing with our kids, in addition to all of the, you know, the bills, worrying about all of the medical bills that are about to start coming down the pike and everything. The thing that got us through that was the relationship that she and I were able to cultivate each other, with each other. It was the trust that we built. It was the love that we built between each other. And the reality of the situation is, I know that because of the disnification that a lot of people, that's all they were told they needed. That's a lie. But now I see a lot of people are being told that they don't need it at all. That is also a lie. I think that you still have to build up a relationship with your partner that can go through the hard times. Because now as both of my parents are reaching 80 years old, now as we having to deal with this medical emergency, a lot of my family members are dying. I had about 20 sets of aunts and uncles on both sides and they're all dropping like flies now. The emotional, the mental and the spiritual impact of this time in my life is crushing and devastating. No amount of money, no amount of status, no amount of good looks, no house, no car, none of that stuff is gonna save me and my wife's relationship. The only, the reason that we pull to each other is because we built a relationship where I can trust her and she can trust me and we do share a love. All of these other things are important, but they are not more important because that is not going to save you when life knocks you on your ass and it will. Yeah. Powerful, powerful. Uh, Anika, anything you would like to add to that? That's, 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 that's very, that was deep. Uh, Je, that was deep, Jay. That was deep. Anika, anything you would like to add to that? I was gonna say I don't. I think he gave the sermon. <laughs> Pass around the office. Like, uh. Can I get an amen? That's it. <laughs> no, I mean that's that's. I think that's the secret sauce. Really, is just um, is having that foundation, that friendship, that relationship. We legit were friends first, like for real, for real. Not friend zone. No, not friend zone. Friends is different. No, we, we were like <laughs> legit friends at first, and we built. A relationship an actual friendship before we even thought about anything else and i think that 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 makes a world of difference because to jay's point like that that friendship that foundation is is what's going to carry you through your the entirety of your marriage because most of the time i would hope that when people get married they're thinking forever not like for a certain season you're thinking until you're old and gray so, you know, once you go through certain phases in life, like you're not, there's certain things that you just will not be able to do that comes with time and age. So having that friendship, having that person that you can trust, having that person that you know is with you through thick and thin, no matter what, makes all the difference in the world. Absolutely. 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 This is a finance channel, everybody. So before we go, I want you guys to all say your businesses and everything. because I want you to make millions of dollars off your businesses so you can walk out of corporate America if you have not done so already. So let's start with you, Tati, ladies first. Uh, please give a shout out to your business. How can people uh, reach out to you? How can people find you? Okay. Um, my business is Toned360 and they can find me on Instagram or TikTok, Get Fit with Tati. On Instagram is Get Fit with underscore Tati. And uh, see you, Tati. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's where they can get a hold of me or my phone number, 801 472 8340. Got you. I had a couple guys reach out to me about you on another podcast we did, so you probably get some guys sliding your DMs, okay? <laughs> okay, Tati. Yeah. Okay. All right, well, as you know, all right, well, you my boy, uh, definitely. I, I love what you're doing with the gentlemen's gathering. So this is a finance channel. Where can people find you so you can stack your paper through your uh, your businesses and everything? Um. So my day to day job again. I, I'm a head underwriter for a merchant cash advance company. So for small businesses who may be looking for you know working capital for their business. Um, I am the individual who essentially has the authority to be able to approve you or deny you for however much money you may need for your business. So um, that is my day job. And then also 
the uh, the gentlemen's gathering is a social networking group. Like I said, that we're working with uh, professional black men here in the city in Miami. Um, you can find my personal Instagram page at mr underscore will white eighty four, and then my um, gentlemen's gathering page is the gentlemen's gathering, all one word on Instagram, uh, where you can find out a lot more about what we do um, and what we're trying to accomplish. What's up? That's what's up. Uh, Leo, I'm an entrepreneur, my teacher. Uh, how about yourself? Businesses. This is a finance channel. Where can people find you and um, uh, your business? Give a shout out to it, okay? So they can start coming to you for whatever things that they need help with. Okay, so my business is the Akuna Matata Tutoring Agency. So we tutor math from pretty much middle school all the way to college. Of course, we do um, a GED if necessary. And um, you can find me on uh, Facebook, Leo Smart, IG, Leo Smart 1207. Got you, got you. Uh, Leo and Will, uh, if any ladies are reaching out to you, they, they would like, they're asking me right now, are you single? Yes. <laughs> Got you. All right, well, I know your game. I know, yes. I know your status, bro. <laughs> so you're good. Shot. <laughs> Miami, y'all stand up. Shot. Uh, That's crazy. Out yourself, bro. <laughs> I love what you're doing with Candy Yams. So give a shout out to your business as well. Yeah, so I'm Rashad Little, Candy Yams Kickback. I can be followed on Facebook at uh, Candid, that's C A N D I D, Yams, Y A M S, Kickback. And on Instagram is C N D I D Gram. And again, I use film and entertainment to educate uh, our community on health, wealth, love, and happiness. Um, and I also uh, will be launching a new product here in the next eight, 12 to 18 months, basically working with companies like Wills, to be honest with you, to host film sessions for them to help them um, with their agendas as well. So I'm looking forward to uh, launching that product as well, because film and media and entertainment uh, needs to be used as a tool to teach our people. Uh, to come together. I just want to give a shout out to the, you know, to you, Chris, but I also want to give a shout out to everybody on this panel as well. For the people that are watching this, I want y'all to understand that everybody has a business that's helping somebody. If y'all paid attention to that, that's just who we are, right? As people for real, you know what I'm saying? So that's why I can't believe, I won't believe that black people just have malicious intent for one another let alone the world because we're a loving kind people and we really do want to help our people it's just about removing that ego that some some entity outside of us gave us we need to remove that to understand that we we can help one another prevail so i appreciate you for having me on chris anytime shot we're gonna do some work outside i would like to do some work with candy yams as well because I, I see what you're doing bro from ten thousand feet away and i want to become a part of it and uh definitely i'll get down with you about that so we can possibly do something uh, remotely because I don't live uh, I don't I don't live near uh, near NC. Okay. Um, cool. And uh, relationship status? You want to go into there? Now the floor is yours. Who me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Oh, I'm single. I'm single. Cool, cool. Uh, Onika Jail. Um, you guys have a phenomenal show, Jermaine and Onika. Uh, by all means, uh, business status and all that good stuff. Where can people uh, meet meet you at? And by the way, everybody, please like, comment, and uh, subscribe to their channel because it is absolute fire. If you're looking for like just legit good relationship advice, listen to this couple because they bring it and they, they they dispel a whole bunch of trash myths that are out there. So, uh, <laughs> not Jo, go go ahead, go ahead. Okay, well, you can find us at the J and O Show um, on YouTube. <laughs> It is um, the the letter J and and then the letter O show. And uh, we'll come up there. Um, we could, we're also on Instagram at the J and Doe show. Um, we're also on TikTok at the J and O show. And we're also on Facebook at the J and O show. The only one that has the and spelled out is on IG. They won't let us do the and symbol. The okay. rest of them have the and symbol. Yeah. And that's pretty much it. Got you, got you. Cool. Thank gotcha. you everybody for your time. This channel, Financial Patience, is all about making money. It's all about saving money. It's all about building generational wealth. And it's all about financially emancipating yourself from generational poverty. You can book a one-on-one -on -one financial consultation session with me. The link is going to be below in the description. I'm not giving you financial advice. So by all means, please do your own independent research in regards to what you invest in. But I can tell you right now from the investments that I have made, my wife and I have more than literally quadrupled uh, our investment accounts in less than three years. So we know what we're doing. Um, also, please follow us at www.therealfinancipation.com, Instagram, Financipation, just like it's spelled in that sign, just like it's spelled in my um, little ticker symbol down there in my name, uh, Spotify, Financipation as well, TikTok, Financipation, and check out my financial blog as well, Financipation. Additionally, you can check me out on my um, my Facebook group, Financipation. I have some digital e-products coming out as well, so if you want to send your kids to college 
for literally a hundred for like 90 percent less than the typical american makes i got a, uh, a digital e product gonna be coming out very soon about that please hit that notification bell please like please comment please just uh please share please subscribe and i want to say thank you to everybody for coming on this show tatiana and uh, onika i want to say thank you for this because i literally put out bulletin saying any woman that wants to come on the podcast by all means please show up and these chicks talked a really good game my dms and everything we got back and forth but none of them wanted to come on this podcast <laughs> i, I want to say thank you ladies for this just because this is the kind of conversation our community needs to start hearing we need to start hearing from the wills the leos the rashads the onikas the jermaine's and the tatis because these are not the kind of conversations that we're having anymore in our churches or that we're having in the bars and the clubs that you're seeing and it's killing the black community it's as simple as that so i want to start having these conversations and doing it more often i love you guys thank you for signing on and it's your boy chris i'm out everybody peace peace, yeah. peace. Bye.